Two of us have a parent with dementia. Four of us have a grandparent with dementia. Two of us live with a person with dementia. And three of us have had to watch our loved one go into residential care. Two of us are bereaved by dementia. Two of us felt that our families tried to protect us from knowing about the dementia. But both of us had already worked out that something was wrong. Two of us have found that our siblings react differently than we do. And three of us have felt alone in our experience. Only two of us knew much about dementia before it happened to someone we love. And only three of us have found it easy to get support. Four of us have felt the impact on our friendships. All of us have felt the impact on our family relationships. None of us identify as young carers. Three of us have felt the impact on our education or work. But all of us have been and continue to be impacted by dementia in our families. My grandmother has dementia. She was diagnosed a couple of years ago. She lives next door to us. My mum has dementia, um, well, early onset Alzheimer's. She was diagnosed, I think it was about four years ago now. I live at home with her, with my dad, I'm an only child, um, and my fiance moved in with us to help. I look after her full time as my job. Yeah, it's pretty full on, <laughs> but I didn't want to have any regrets in the future. My mum's mum had um, dementia later in life, but she always regretted not being able to take her in and look after her. So I didn't want to have the same regrets that she does. So that's why I'm doing it. A few years ago, when I was in year 11, I think she was diagnosed and she was moved to a home quite close to us to start off with. It was just like a general uh, elderly aged care home. Now she's moved to a home specifically for Alzheimer's and dementia. I came into a household not understanding um, anything about dementia and how it affects people and families. Coming into my grandmother's home and the way that she lived day by day, spontaneously, trying to understand the man that she loved, living with it for a couple of years, seeing it go so quickly downhill, it's, it's definitely a journey and it's definitely a challenge. Um, but you do, you grow in it and you do get through it, definitely. Right, yeah, my granddad um, had dementia. Um, he passed away, I think, three years ago when I was in year 11, the start of year 11. Um, so throughout my whole um, high school and the later years of primary school, um, he, he had dementia. He was diagnosed when I think I was in year five. Had... Um, that is another thing that I was uh, going through while I was going through high school. Um, we were lucky in the fact that he lived directly across the road from us, so we didn't actually, you know, we didn't have to travel. We were able to see him daily and help him daily and we were able to keep him in his house, which I think was a major benefit for him and for us, being able to see him as regular as we could. My mum is now 57 years old and uh, she was diagnosed with dementia around about age 50 while I was in year 12. It was quite difficult at the time with the high demands of high school and trying to get through that and having to worry about family situations at the same time was quite difficult for me and the rest of my family. Um, she now resides in high level facility. Um, but yeah, it's a journey that I'm going on with my mum and the rest of my family. And it's actually, it's quite interesting and challenging at times, but you know, it's nice to have your family come together and do it as well. Up until year five, six, seven, um, I was going over to Grandad's place every day after school because mum would work late and dad didn't live with us at the time. Um, and I'd go over to Grandad's place when my grandma was still there and that you know feed me and my brother and we'd sit down and, and watch television and they'd kind of encourage us to do homework, stuff like that. And then it kind of just slowly swapped and me and my brother would go over there of an evening and make sure they were, that Grandad was eating, make sure in the summertime he didn't have too many clothes on, which he tended to do. Um, just kind of make sure he was comfortable, make sure he was um, all set up for the evening and wasn't going to get confused and, and stuff. So it kind of just swapped the relationship. Yeah, I feel like it all happened really quickly from the time she was diagnosed up until, 
you know, until now it's just progressed very rapidly. And so your typical mother-daughter relationship is, you know, you, c- you shouldn't do it, but you compare it to your friends and the relationships they have with their parents and it's like as though our roles have changed and it's quite cr- confronting at times. But um, you learn to connect with them in different ways than what you had previously. It doesn't have to be verbal communication, but you... You learn to do other things like connect with them through music and other wonderful things like that. I can totally understand your situation because it's very odd the way the relationship changes. As growing up, my dad was always away for work and it was just me and mum, like always. And she would always look after me, she'd do anything for me, and then it all changes and it's really, yeah, confronting and hard. <laughs> My grandmother got older. She stopped looking after me and I started looking after her more. Sort of got to make sure she's like cleaning out the fridge, make sure it's all good. She doesn't lock her doors really at all at night. Sort of small things that add up. I did find over the time that he had dementia and developed that he had different parts of his personality come out. Some good, some bad, some funny, some a bit of a roller coaster, but. I think over time you get to know every single part of the person. Even as he deteriorated, his personality never changed and and he was always still the same uh, granddad that I always had. No, I found for me, um, I was a completely different person. Like, not even the tiniest bit like how she was. Yeah, I agree with you, Anna. Um, My mum, yeah, is completely different to how she used to be. And it's sad, but at the same time, sometimes it actually helps me deal with it a lot easier if I think of her as a different person. Like, she's always going to be my mum and always will be. Um, But it's nice getting to know the newer person she is today and going along that journey with her. I feel like for me, it was... I think I was more worried about myself at first. I was very selfish about it. I was like, oh... What am I going to do and how is this going to affect me? It's kind of scary, like going down a rabbit hole, you don't know where it ends. Apart from that, it's pretty bit reserved. You push it away a bit? Mm, not personally, more... I have lots of family to support, it's equally distributed. I'm sure it'd be like a lot harder for you being one-on-one or two-on-one. I don't think you can compare it. I think it's just yeah, different. Definitely. Because like I've been through the grandparent side of it and that's really hard. It's just so different than being a parent. Yeah. But it doesn't take away from how hard a grandparent is because you can be so close to your grandparents, like you live with your grandmother. and um, When you're with it, you go home to it, you've got it there when you wake up and it's just as part of your lifestyle, you live with it. I think initially it's very frustrating and you feel like you're alone and not many people are around you that understand what you're going through. Um, but it's kind of hard to deal with it because it's like when she was first diagnosed, you go through a grieving process and when you go and visit them and you want to be as involved as you can in their life, it's really difficult because you're constantly reminded that your mum isn't really like everyone else's. It's hard going to where she is now. Like, you have to walk in there and it's sort of like a certain smell, a certain, like, atmosphere and, like, they're all sort of sort of sitting together usually like in the same spot every time and it's sort of and no one remembers you and sort of oh hi there and they're like who are you and all this it's a bit it's a bit confronting to go in there and visit so it's hard it's not like a pleasant experience ever really so I know like my brothers really they try and sort of avoid it a bit like they don't really enjoy going in there and visiting. I think everyone deals with things differently like my, my brother's similar in that sense it's you know, not all of us cope with it the same and yeah. sometimes it's easier for us to distance ourselves for things that are emotionally difficult for us. Um, but, yeah, we all understand it different ways and learn to cope with it differently. I was going to say before when you were saying about other people, their mums, like watching them have a relationship with their parents, I get so jealous, yeah. <laughs> really jealous of, like, especially, like, when you see people who have an opportunity to be really close. Yeah. So, I was really worried about the unknown. I felt like when she was diagnosed that they didn't really give us much direction in terms of what's going to happen in the next two years, five years, ten years. Um, But I did find out that they said that anyone from diagnosis um, can live from five to 20 years. And when you hear that, that's just a ridiculous time frame and you don't really know what to expect in the time in between. It's quite difficult. 
um, just like every story is different. So I felt like all I wanted to do is find out answers and, you know, just tell me straight up what's going on and what I'm going to expect and the things that I can, you know, um, watch happen to my mum. But, yeah, they weren't able to tell me definite answers and I found that quite difficult and really scary not knowing what's going to happen. So exactly the same, really. Fear of the unknown is sort of the main thing to start with and then become more familiar with the situation sort of helps with it a bit. I'd say that I worry about my dad more than I would normally. So apart from that, it doesn't impact too much in my case. But still that thought of like, is she all right? What's, is there anyone looking after her at home? I think during the time that my mum was diagnosed, it impacted quite a lot um, on my education while I was finishing year 12. But it soon became a matter of just getting through the year rather than excelling in my final year. Um, at the end of the day, I still got to where I want to be and I'm still studying. Um, and studying osteopathy, you know, in the healthcare system, your coordinators and teachers understand your situation more than anyone will ever. So that makes it really, really helpful that they're very supportive of me and they all know that my family comes first. And yeah, it's really nice to have them, have them around and have such support from a university. Yeah, I found that, oh, I had to leave my job to look after mum, but it's definitely impacted my education. I've had to put off graduating by a year, um, studying education, primary teaching. But I think also because of the field I'm going into, a lot of my teachers are really understanding. Like if you are up front at the start of the trimester and say, look, this is what I'm dealing with, this is how it affects my study, they're really understanding and they'll practically bend over backwards to make you pass, basically, like help you get through like I've got a learning access plan, so basically they have on file everything they've gone through and then they pass that along if my teachers request it. So what I've let my teachers know, I say I've got this set up, they'll have a look and they've got my whole file because it can be quite emotional. You know, you've got a different teacher for every class and then you've got to explain your whole life story every time, so that's really helpful. I think it's only natural that when something occurs that you usually have one or two people that step up and take responsibility and a few members of my family have you know, taken on the legalities and organised medical power of attorneys and things like that. But you know, at the time, whatever the person needs, um, you know, if they need to withdraw from the situation a little bit or if they need to hold back just so they can adapt to it and try and understand it a little bit more, like it takes some more time for some people to come to terms with what's happening in their life and if they need that extra time to to take it in and understand it then you, yeah you can't you know beat them up about it because everyone does take things in differently and understand things differently and you know really you can just focus on what you're doing for yourself sort of worry for my younger cousins because my nan looked after me a lot when i was younger when i was sort of four or five my parents were working but my youngest cousin is that age now and he's not going to have any memory of her before the dementia. I feel that with my mum's mum because all of my cousins, they all have kids almost my age, so I was a lot younger and I never got to because she had dementia so I never had all the memories that they have. Like when my cousin said she used to go out and she'd stay with their nanny and she'd come home and they'd like talk about her night out and like she might have kissed a boy and it was all like she was a cheeky woman and I... I cannot remember her like that. I don't have that memory of her. So yeah, I can see what you mean like with your cousins. Yeah, me and my brother kind of just took on a almost like accessory role to mum who was primary um, caregiver to granddad. Being just across the road, we were able to help her out with a lot of the physical stuff like giving him, helping him get his dinner sorted and, and making sure, you know, stuff was washed for him, his house was clean. Um, everything was, you know, orderly and neat and stuff. She did a lot of that stuff as well. Um, but she was also having to deal with all the paperwork and the medications and the admin part of things. I knew that my nan was the rock. She was the one that was caring for him and had to keep going and that sort of thing. So I guess my job was to keep her going sort of thing. Let her know, look, it's time. You can't look after him anymore. You need to, you know, you need to do your own thing as well. Sometimes that's letting go.
when um, his, his wife moved out into a residential care, he'd get really, really confused and lost and quite lonely, I think. And so he'd call our home phone 15, 20 times in the space of an hour. And it got to a point where we'd have to kind of go over and, and set him up and just, you know, make him a, a dessert or, you know, set up a TV so he had something on and give him, give him some, some, something to occupy himself and that would kind of settle him down for the night. And once we went over and sorted him out, he wouldn't call again, he'd go to sleep. It, very, it depends on my mood. It depends on how big the tantrum is that she's throwing. Like, say you're in the supermarket and I'll ignore something she's saying because I'm reading something or I'm trying to find something. And I always end up getting flustered being out with her. Um, and she'll just, you know, throw something on the ground and like, cross her arms and walk away like in a huff. So it's just I've got to clutch myself first and go, she doesn't... She's not doing that on purpose. She can't control her feelings. That's, you know, she's showing every feeling she has, like, straight out. And I've just got to not care what people think. You know, I'll be walking around home, she'll hold my hand. So it's pretty obvious now for some people that there's something going on. But it can be very frustrating and embarrassing. So I think the best way is to just not worry about it. You know, have a laugh when they do something funny. Go along with their stories and... Otherwise, you get too caught up in yourself and how you look, and it's really not important in the long run. I actually had a situation. Um, my grandmother was being beaten by him at some stage. I had run downstairs and I had to get him off her somehow. I immediately reacted by saying something of habit. We went out for picnics a lot and so I said, we're going off for a picnic, we're getting in the car, because yelling his name, trying to pull him off her and that sort of thing, it just did not work. So me saying, we're going to picnic, get in the car, he immediately just stopped, went to the car. Yeah, I find distraction and diversion is really helpful. So if I, I could literally just be like, oh, look at that over there, and that'll just, like, break her out of that repetitive cycle of questions or arguments or another one is if dad's not there my dad and I have pretty much found that it goes if I'm with mum she'll constantly ask where dad is if she's with dad she constantly asks where I am so I'll say okay let's go call dad and I'll get the phone and I'll dial and put her on it and he'll just say hi I'm I'll be home at this time or I'm just doing this and that'll just calm her down and then I can use that for the next two hours of remember we just spoke to dad and he's doing that I can repeat everything that he said and she might pick up on one of them and go, yeah, I do remember that. I wouldn't say that my grandmother gets angry or screaming, but she does get very worked up. Panic. Yeah, she yeah, panics. Say, yeah. And one of our strategies in my family is it normally it doesn't end up it's on a purpose. It normally ends up with my parents sort of trying to enforce and you need to do this, this is really important. My nana gets worked up and then I end up going over there and doing sort of good cop. Like, yeah. this is a good idea. Like, you don't have to do it if you don't want to, but... Sort of, it's there to help. I kind of, at least that's one thing that's helped my family a bit. I mean, my granddad, it wasn't so much aggressive, but he did sometimes say racially inappropriate things <laughs> at times because of growing up in, you know, 1940s Glasgow um, and then coming to Australia. Sometimes what was politically correct kind of did escape him. It was lucky enough that people didn't hear and, and think, you know, what an asshole for saying stuff like that because um, that, that wasn't him. He'd never go out to deliberately say something to offend someone, but it just sometimes slipped his mind that that's not actually politically correct. That's not how you refer to people nowadays. Your grandma had the same problem when you're walking down the streets with her and stuff. She'd like, oh, that person's had a bit too much to eat or something like that. It's a bit, <laughs> it's a bit hard because she's, she's just like a little, she's about half my height and just like really sweet and like, not like that at all. She doesn't look at people and, like, I don't know, judge them badly, but... Does anyone here sometimes yeah. wish you could have a badge that they could wear? Yeah. <laughs> it's OK, I have Alzheimer's. <laughs> I'm not a rude person. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all the time. <laughs> I think you're very right. They sort of lose their filter, like their ability yeah. to tell what an appropriate thing to say is. You had to realise also it's not their fault. Yeah. They don't mean to hurt you or 
you know, if they get aggressive or yeah. angry at you and they're yelling at you, it's like, well, that's not the person that you remember. That's a different version of them. I feel like it's important that you don't lose the connection you had with them, although it may be different, you still, it's important to try and find different things that help you connect with them. Like my mum now doesn't really speak that much. You know, she still recognises me, but she knows that I'm someone really close to her, but she's not exactly aware that I'm her daughter. But communicating verbally isn't everything with someone. I think it's really powerful when you can communicate with people. You know, I always play music for my mum and, you know, sometimes it makes her laugh or cry or, yeah, bring back some sort of memory, which if it makes her cry, it's actually, it's upsetting, but it, it, it's nice that she can bring back some sort of memory that she can associate that song to. And if music's all we got left, then I'm happy to be doing that. Bernard just loves telling stories he, like, about back in Scotland but when he first moved over and so I kind of just... Even though I'd heard him, I knew him word for word, I'd just get him to tell me the stories and he loved it. Um, so and he genuinely enjoyed in that moment telling that story. And then 20 minutes later, if you wanted to tell it again, I'd sit down and listen to it because he, you know, he didn't remember that he'd told it 20 minutes ago. So he got the same enjoyment from telling me, um, you know, a few times in an evening the same story. You probably will have the same conversation with this person, whoever your person is, multiple times. If you do sit there and let them tell their stories, sometimes you'll get like this little yeah. moment of clarity and they'll say something really important or mm -hmm. interesting that you didn't know about them. So that can be quite rewarding. Mm -hmm. Be good to have the patience to stick it out. <laughs> yeah, I found that my nana does, like she can't remember some very basic things because of the dementia, but then she'll pull something like amazing out of her childhood. Mm -hmm. Just like, how do, you, how do you remember like the smell in London when you were like a kid? It's like you have these crystal clear memories of when you're a kid, but you don't know how to tie your shoelaces. Mm. It's just so, it can be really baffling, like how that happens. I think having an escape is important. I guess like you don't have to live with them being able to go home and have your own time. See, for me, I can't really get away. She's right there and she'll. Every morning I wake up to her ring, her wedding ring, scratching on my glass door. I'll be lying there and I'm like, oh, no, please don't. <laughs> but, but you know it'll happen every morning. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But at the same time, I love that if she needs me, she knows where I am. It's not just, you know, you and them. It's sort of like a family thing. Like, I know Grandma and I used to be really close on our own, sort of, but it's sort of hard to go, I can't really visit her on my own anymore. So now, you know, you've got mum there to sort of, you share the stories and you can tell your mum the story and grandma might be like, oh, I remember like, I don't know, baking cookies. And with my friends, it makes the relationship that I have with my friends and their family a lot closer. And my best friend plays a really important part in my life and her family has been great and very supportive. So to spend time with my friends' families, it's nice to be in that family environment, both with my best friend's family and my partner's family as well. You feel very isolated and no one understands, but they can't understand unless you explain it to them. So I think that's important. Tell your friends what you need. Because people always think, I want to help, but then they'll step back because they don't know how to. But if you say specifically, oh, if you cooked one meal a night for my dad, that would be really helpful. I think sometimes, you know, you expect a lot from your friends to say, you know, how are you going? But when, when someone asks you how are you going it's, or how's your mum going, it's a really difficult question to answer. And while it might be difficult for us to answer, it might also be difficult for them to ask because they don't want to, don't want to hear the bad news or hear something that may upset their friend. Um, but if there's anything that you do need, it's important that you voice that and yeah, let them know specifically if there's anything that they can do to help you. You learn that you've got lots of people there, like my family, they've all been really good. And like, I guess at the start, they were kind of sheltering my brothers and I a bit, like it sort of came like quite a, a bit of a shock because they didn't really tell us when like she got diagnosed and stuff. And then one day they're just like, oh, she's getting a little bit sort of wandering. She's like going to a new home and all this. And I don't know, sort of they're all trying to protect you and keep you, I don't know, happy and, make it a little bit easier on you and it was sort of nice to learn that they're all there. 
like they're always gonna, you know, make things easier for you and stuff. It was quite nice to learn that. Moving in and that sort of thing, I didn't come from the best background. So just starting life again and um, starting a new chapter, coming into a, I guess, family with a dementia, you are built a bit more independence, I guess. I think when you go through something at such a young age, you, you're forced to grow up very quickly, quicker than, than you should at the age that you're at. Um, but you don't really think about it too much because you do absolutely everything you can for the people that, that you love and your family. So I think, you know, once you know that you've done everything that you can and, you know, it doesn't really matter that, you know, you're 22 years old and you're worrying about a whole world of things that you never thought you'd have to worry about. but. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It's made you who you are today. And building up the fact that you do have a voice and that you can make a difference to your, the way you live and the way your loved ones live, that's a big thing um, and a big thing to learn. I feel like I'll realise a lot after, like, mum's in a home. I feel like sort of putting off a lot of everything, emotion and all of that because it's like you're just getting through. So I think once... I don't know. I keep thinking of like when it's over, but it's like I think once she's in a home, there'll be a lot of relief for me and my dad. So, and then maybe then they'll sort of maybe start realizing how I've changed or that sort of thing. I think it's okay to not be okay. Experiencing something like this definitely isn't easy and has its own challenges, but. You don't always have to be the tough one. It's okay to sit in your emotions and actually think and understand what you're going through is really a quite difficult thing for someone to go through at a young age or any age for that matter. And while the people around you may not understand exactly what you're going through, it's still important that you share your experiences with those around you because it'll, it'll help them understand your experience a, a little bit more and it'll help you, you know, get your feelings off your chest. And well, I think I'm really looking back on it, um, cherish that time that I did get to spend with granddad that um you know it, it seemed like a chore at the time but now I think about it, it was a good time that you know I went over and spent half an hour 45 minutes just kind of helping him get sorted out for the evening and he'd just kind of ramble on tell stories that he's told a million times before but I'm never going to forget those stories definitely you need to have a sense of patience just having the same conversation or just dealing with certain quirks that your person has. Sometimes you just want to run away, but it is sort of rewarding in some respects, knowing that you've done everything you can. Mm, I wouldn't say you get used to living with the unknown, but the unknown becomes a little bit more known to you, sort of becomes more of a common thing in everyday life, rather than just sort of this strange thing happening to someone you love. Yeah, you get used to life being a bit crazy. You get used to the fact that they're going to be unpredictable and say inappropriate things and you get used to, you just, you just expect it. Yeah. And I think learning to laugh about it, we were all talking about that earlier, it's just the best therapy. Like if you, they do something silly instead of feeling embarrassed and self-conscious, like go along with it. <laughs> like when my mum's telling a story to someone and I'll just be like, yeah, yeah, I remember that and that was great and I see how happy she is because she's, you know, you're joining in her, yeah. even though it's a made up memory, it's still, to her, it feels real. Make sure you do some of the research that you need to actually understand how to deal with some of the issues that people with dementia have. So rather than get frustrated and yell and, you know, repeat questions that they're struggling to answer, kind of learning how to frame things differently, learning how to respond differently to the issues that they face is pretty important because for people with dementia, it is all in the moment. If they're happy in that moment, then that's all That's all that you really can do. I think keep your sense of humour. There's always a funny side to things. Um, if you didn't laugh, you'd cry. We always say in our household. <laughs> yeah, definitely cry. Like, if you've got someone you're close to who's happy to sit there while you let it out, definitely do. And, I don't know, maybe looking at us all here talking about it from a very like philosophical point of view but it's it is very hard very hard and it's okay to realize that